here we go. All right. Relative dating is nice. Okay, you can do the relative dating. This is young. This is a little older. This is older than that thing. This is older than that. Older than that thing. And then you compare. That's great. But I want numbers. How do you attach specific numbers to these things you're trying to date relatively? Um, that's today. We're going to border on a little bit of chemistry. If you've had some chemistry, it's going to help. If you haven't, welcome. Here we go. Protons, neutrons, and electrons. That you have had. I know you had that all the way back to even middle school. You've had that. All right. Protons are positive. Neutrons are neutral. Electrons are negative. Electrons are teeny, teeny, tiny. One one thousandth the mass of the other two. Protons and neutrons are essentially the same mass. They're really, really, really close. And for our purposes today, they, they're the same. So what do you do? Protons are positive. Proton tells you what it is. If you have six protons, you have carbon. All right, if you have seven protons, you have nitrogen. Eight protons, you have oxygen. And on and on and on, right? If you have one proton, you have hydrogen. Proton tells you what it is. Neutrons give you a flavor. Because six protons for carbon, well, is it carbon that's graphite? Is it carbon that's diamond? Is it carbon that's in a long chain? Like, how are the carbon atoms arranged? That depends on the number of neutrons. Like, you can get different flavors of the same element. And then that affects how they bond to each other. So, here we go. Radioactivity, okay? That is not what happens when you turn on the antenna and you get some radioactivity. Radioactivity is when an unstable nucleus, nucleus is the middle, right? What's in the middle? Protons and neutrons. Electrons are out here running around all crazy. Protons and neutrons are in the middle. That's the nucleus. That's the center. That's the core. If that's not stable, it's because it's the wrong number of nu uh, neutrons. Okay, there's too much or too little mass in there, all packed in real tight. If that's unstable, it's going to break apart. Something's going to break off of it. And when it does, you have a new thing. And I have to say thing because it's kind of general. Sometimes you have a new element. Sometimes you just have a new isotope. So the original unstable thing is the parent. The product, what happens after it breaks off or changes, is the daughter. Okay? Um, and then that daughter. Is the daughter stable? Well, if it came, she came from an unstable parent, she may not be stable, right? And then she breaks off, and now she has a daughter, and on and on and on and on and on. So you, it, the radioactivity, radioactive decay, continues until you reach a stable isotope, a stable element. And then it just stops. That's it. It's done. All right. We're going to look at three kind of categories of these. There are lots and lots of different ways. We're going to hit just the basics. We're going to get the surface right here. Alpha decay. Alpha is first letter in the Greek alphabet. It's just a name. Alpha decay. What happens? You've got a big old unit of a nucleus. And all of a sudden, four things break off. Two protons, two neutrons. So really what happens is helium-4 because that's two protons and two neutrons. Helium-4 just goes, and then this is what's left. This is So you have two daughters. They split, right? And, uh, you don't usually call the helium the alpha. You call that an alpha particle. It's helium-4. It goes away. So what's left here is now the daughter. Maybe stable, maybe not. What happens? If you took two protons away and you took two electrons away, well, now all of a sudden the mass is down by four units, four atomic units, and the protons are down by two, it changed elements. It changed what type of element it is. The atomic number went down by two. So if you have the periodic table, the atomic number is now two lower than it was. So if you had oxygen, 
that was unstable and alpha decayed, it would go down two elements and become a carbon. And that's really unusual, maybe. All right, beta emission. You have nucleus. Okay, everything is good. And all of a sudden, a beta particle pops off. Okay. Well, the beta particle is just... Uh, no, we're not even. Gonna, it's a it's a negative part of something. Something bothers this, and the negative comes off. And what happens? This neutral, this neutron, flips and becomes a proton. So it gets a positive charge. A negative charge goes off. So charge is balanced. And when you gain a proton, well, the mass didn't change because the neutron turned into the proton, and they weigh the same. The charge changed but more importantly the atomic number changed it went one up on the periodic table because it used to have 27 protons and then one of the neutrons flipped and now it's got 28 protons it's kind of odd third kind electron capture we could do this exactly in reverse you have a proton, you got your nucleus. One of the protons, electron comes along, hits a proton, that becomes, it flips. So you take that positive or negative, now you've got a neutral there. And so the atomic number goes down one, the mass stays the same. Those are three broad categories, three different types of radioactive decay. Okay. Cool. How often does that happen? Is that rare? Is that common? It's a great question. And the answer is very dependent. Okay. If you had a bucket of change and you shook it up really well and you tossed it all in the air and they landed, half of them would be on heads and half of them would be on tails. If you take away all the heads take all the coins, you put them back in the bucket, you shake it up, and you throw it up. And they all land across the floor. Half of them on heads, half of them on tails. And you take that number of heads and you slide it off to the side. And you put the rest of the change in there and shake, shake, shake. Every single time, half of those are going to land heads and tails, roughly. Statistically, half of them land on heads and tails. If you've got 100, maybe the first run is like 52 to 48, Right? That's about half. That's close enough. So every time you do that, half the coins have decayed. Well, how long does it take you to gather the coins up, put them back in the bucket, and shake again? Because that is the half-life. How long it takes for all of those coins, if we, get, if we take the ones that land on heads and we slide them away and get rid of them, how long does it take for that cycle to repeat? That's a half-life. It's the amount of time necessary for one half of the radioactive nuclei to, in a sample to decay to a stable isotope. Okay, so you need the amount of the parent and the daughter. You need to know how much of each one you've got, and then you, when you measure the, what's left, the ratio tells you what's going on. It's time for some pictures. Here we go. In the beginning, this is an example of beta decay. You've got a proton and a neutron, and if you get rid of this negative part here, all of a sudden this neutron becomes positive. Don't worry about that. This is what we're interested in. Blue line. Focus on the blue line. If you have all of the things all mixed up, and they're all coins, Okay, and we go through and you shake them all up and you throw them out on the floor. Half after one time, half of them were heads, and you slid that to the side. You put everybody else back in the bucket and you shake it up. Half of what's left will turn to heads on the next roll. So, in other words, now one quarter of what you started with is all that's left. Right, because you slide the heads over. 
and then you do it again, and it's an eighth, and then a sixteenth, and then a thirty-second, sixty-four, one twenty-eight, two fifty-six, five twelve, a thousand twenty-four, and on and on and on and on. Here's the thing: these aren't coins that you slide across. Okay, I, I like the. I like the visual, but it's not perfect because the coins don't go away. They just stay heads. I guess you glue them to the bucket, you glue them to the table, so they stay heads, and then you take all the other ones and you flip them again, right? And as soon as you lay it on heads, you're stuck because that's stable. So over time, the tails slowly popcorn and flip and flip and flip and flip and flip until all of a sudden the number of heads on the table started at zero, right? And then after the first flip, half of them were heads. And then after two flips, three quarters. And then seven eighths and on and on and on. So almost all of them are heads by the time you're moving on. And the number left in the bucket that are still mixed up is shrinking because the number that are in the bucket is the ones that still can. So how long is a half-life? Well, here we go. Lead for this type of lead is 22 years. That's pretty short. Um, for uranium-238, yeah, that's 4 billion, 500 million years. Uranium-235, you're like, oh, they're both types of uranium. But yeah, that's only 700 million years. But this is over six times longer for its half-life than this one is. And they're both types of uranium. They decay differently. Chemistry is weird like that, and they decay differently. So what in the world? You've heard of carbon-14. It decays into nitrogen-14. 5,730 years is the half-life. That's the one that's interesting for dating young things because this can work. Well, what do we mean? So 5,000 years, now 10,000 years, and then 15 and 20 and on and on and on, right? Well, it's almost six, so it's more than that. But after several times, there's nothing left it hasn't been converted, and there's everything is the other already flipped. So it's not useful after eight or ten or twelve half lives. Depends on which book you ask. You'll see anywhere from sixty or fifty-five to seventy-five thousand years is all carbon dating is good for. When let me rephrase that. When people say carbon dating using shorthand, they mean Radioactive dating of carbon-14. Okay. <clears throat> so here's the interesting thing. Each isotope, yeah, has been decaying at a constant rate, um, blah, 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 since the formation of the rocks, uranium-238, we've got right here, 4 billion, 500 million years. Okay. What's interesting is before uranium-238 turns into lead-206 here, there are 13 steps in between, 13 daughters. So uranium-238 turns to, I forget, the next one turns into plutonium, and, and that does not. Then that turns into hafnium, and that turns into cesium, and, and on and on and on. And then 13 steps later, you get to lead-208. You need to know the original, and you need to know what's left. This is going to, uh, this is just so, this is using meteorites because I, I like space and whatever. So, things that are common on meteorites that are not necessarily going to be common in earth rocks or, or living material. So, different half lives for different elements. All right. Here's the thing carbon 14 is produced in our atmosphere, it's naturally occurring radioactive element. Okay, every carbon-14 up in the atmosphere easily gets turned into carbon dioxide. So some of the carbon in carbon dioxide is not carbon-12, it's carbon-14. Okay, so it's a little heavier. So what? No big deal. 
What you do, though, is then, once it's carbon dioxide, every living thing on the planet absorbs it. It breathes it in, breathes it out, breathes it in, breathes it out. Plants, animals, everything has a chance of holding this carbon-14 in its body. So, mummified bones, plant fossils, yes. Dinosaur bones, no. Not really, because dinosaurs died, um, I don't know, the last extinction was, what, 65 million years ago? 65 million, this is only good for 60,000 years. So the percentage of carbon-14 left in dinosaur bones is that was originally there, nothing. There's nothing. Nothing that was originally there is still there. All right. I'm going to give you the link to this FET. Uh, P-H-E-T is FET, Colorado.edu. Um, so it does work on your Chromebook. You're going to have to click Java, and I know it's it's not really Java, install Java. It's just running a browser-compatible version, and since it's it works. Okay. The radioactive dating game. All right, there's half-life, decay rates. We're going to work on a little of all this. So I'm going to add some atoms here. Ah, it's very slow because I'm running the recording thing. We're going to add. There we go. And we're going to let it go. Hey, look. Somebody just decayed. Somebody else decayed. This is moving across here. So the time in years, so here's 2,000 years, 3,000 years, 4,000 years. Look at the percentage. Look at the ratio of carbon-14 that you start with that's radioactive and nitrogen-14. Hey, look here, right here at this dotted red line. Oh, it's half of them, half of each. And slowly, these carbon-14s are all popping and changing. Look, now th we're about to approach three-quarters of it to be nitrogen-14, right there, after that many half-lives, right? So 5, 10, 15,000, three-quarters of it is past. So you can add more buckets. You can change instead of carbon. If you want to do this with uranium, the half-life is 4 billion years. 4.57, right? So we put some uranium up there. And the more you put up there, the the better this is. Because if it's not perfect, right? These decay randomly, spontaneously. So it's just like flipping coins. If you have 100 coins and you flip them heads and tails, you are not going to get 50-50. You're going to get 51-49 or 52 or 48. Or you might get 50-50. But you're not, the more you have, the better you see how close it is to true even. Okay? So, same thing. You can watch this percent wheel. I want you to look through these things. Right, we pause that. Let's go to decay rates here. All right. Um, this is the number of nuclei you want up. Let's put all these up. Let's get lots of nuclei. We're going to reset them and we're going to play. Watching the number of each one, so this is, again, this is back to carbon-14, so here the red line is half-life, 50%. This is going to go down to one quarter. This is going to go up to three quarters here. Then we're going to go to one-eighth and seven-eighths. When you get to three half-lives, you can watch the number, the relative red here. But see how few red there are now, Right? So even after, here's your per percent remaining, you know, even after 20,000 years, 40,000 years, look, you've only got just a couple of reds left there. You can't use this method forever. Pause that. Measurement. Ooh, this is a good test. We're going to reset this. All right. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to plant a tree. 60 years, 100 years, everything's good. And I can go over here and I can measure the tree. That's 100% carbon-14. 
Now I'm going to kill the tree. Shouldn't do that. Watch this. This is measuring the percentage in the tree. And the percentage is slowly, oh, the tree died. Now I've got to move and adjust this. So it's actually picking numbers up again. This is an older FET. They've made all of them now HTML5. They're cleaner and smoother. But the percentage, you can watch the percentage go down as you do this. Or I could do carbon the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12. What's interesting is you don't always compare carbon-14 to nitrogen-14. Sometimes you can compare it to carbon-12, which is the regular carbon available and you're looking at that ratio instead of the carbon, the parent to daughter ratio. All right. You could do the same with the rock, but then if you use the rock, you're going to have to use uranium or it's no good. All right. The dating game. Here you go. We're going to reset this. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick this skull right here. All right, 0.0 or 0.8 percent. Then I'm going to slide this over until it tells me, huh? See? So uranium 238. Yep, yeah, there would be zero of that. The skull's not the one I was looking for. Fossil works really well. All right. Carbon-14, see, uranium doesn't work for that one. I'll go back to the carbon-14, let it update. 88.2%. Guess what? If it's 88.2%. Seriously? So I come down here and I type in 1,000 years and I check my estimate. Gives me a nice little feedback there. And you can measure different things. Down here you use uranium. Up here you use carbon-14. And you can estimate the percent of carbon-14 remaining. This is going to be your activity for the week. Send me some screenshots. Tell me some things you learned. This video is getting out there, so I can type the instructions if you need some more instructions. Have a good day.